So thank you for this introduction and very happy to be here. Also, thank you to World Satellite Business Week uh, to give this opportunity to explain to you what ESA is doing. So you may ask, uh, we're talking of business, what is ESA doing here as a public entity and what is the, the message of ESA? And actually, there's a lot which uh, ESA as a publicly funded uh, organization is having to say here, and I will go through some of the slides, uh, which you will see in, in a minute, but just to say that uh, commercialization and business is a top priority for us, has always been, but also in my agenda 2025, which I'm sure you have uh, seen bits and pieces of it, this is one of the main priorities, and where I really think that uh, we have to do much more in Europe uh, in order to develop the business uh, sector uh, with the help of public entities. But let me go through some of the first uh, messages, how, do, how we get there. I don't think I need to introduce ESA, it's well known, but really to say that uh, we have been building up industry in Europe uh, over decades. We have a very strong international cooperation network with uh, many space agencies. We are probably the space agency worldwide with uh, most agreements uh, with all corners of the world. Obviously, we have uh, key partners uh, in the US with NASA, with whom we work for decades, but also with many other space agencies with whom we work for many, many years uh, very successfully, including Russia, China, India, Australia, and many, many more. And this really is a strength of ESA that we have this uh, very strong network. But if I say that uh, ESA and Europe wants to increase its uh, ambition, it is also that we are a strong and good partner to other space agencies and other partners in, uh, in, in, in the world. Some of the upcoming uh, highlights, uh, and this underline uh, some of the international cooperation we, we do have with our partners. You see here the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which is being launched on the 22nd of December uh, from uh, French Guiana, Kourou, with uh, an Ariane 5 rocket. And this is actually something I am really very, very happy with, uh, that uh, NASA has entrusted this launch of a generation to ESA, uh, that we are happy to provide this service. Of course, we're doing our utmost and our best to be a very, very strong and good partner to make sure that this uh, jewel, which is really a unique, uh, 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 unique satellite, uh, a unique telescope, uh, which uh, will operate for decades, uh, will be brought safely to space. And this is, uh, as you can imagine, a, a big responsibility, but also something that really underlines also the trusted relationship we have with NASA. And as you see also the CSA logo here being, uh, being a partner on the James Webb Space Telescope. Choose another mission which we have, uh, which is uh, being prepared uh, for launch uh, in uh, early 23 uh, to uh, monitor and to observe uh, Jupiter, again, uh, something where we are quite active on the space science domain. Pepe Colombo, uh, flyby on Mercury, which happened recently, a mission together with JAXA, uh, where we have uh, been, it's actually two satellites in one mission, uh, where we have really been working very closely hand in hand with our Japanese colleagues uh, to build this mission. Uh, and of course, the uh, mission to uh, Mercury or the observations of Mercury yet to come. Another important one, ExoMars. Uh, as you know, DGO, uh, the satellite is uh, flying around ExoMars since 2016, is providing extremely valuable uh, data transmission uh, capabilities for our international partners, but also has made very important observations of Mars itself. And next year, we have uh, another launch, uh, ExoMars, uh, which will bring a, ro a rover, as you see it here, uh, to the Mars surface. And here in this project, we work very closely, very well uh, with Roscosmos. Uh, we are in the final stages of uh, making sure that we do meet the launch window in September uh, next year, which is unique. As you know, if we are missing that one, it would be another two years slip. So we cannot afford that. And we have actually intensified quite a lot, uh, many of the cooperations which we have, uh, including a recent successful parachute test, uh, uh, which uh, reassures us that the, the landing uh, should go safe. Again, some upcoming milestones listed here on a time graph. Uh, some of them are the same as before, but just to highlight, uh, apart from the James Webb Space Telescope launch, of course, which is uh, a very big event, uh, we're looking forward to Artemis 1, where the European Service Module is a, a very important aspect, uh, a very important element of uh, uh, the Artemis mission. Uh, and uh, of course, this is uh, a highlight. Uh, the launch is uh, planned sometimes uh, 
next year. So there's a, a wrong date on this slide here. It's not Q4 2021. It will be uh, next year, but certainly one of the highlights. Then Vega C and Ariane 6 uh, maiden launches of a completely new rocket of Ariane 6, but also Vega C in a much higher uh, performance. Uh, we have an astronaut selection coming up uh, towards the end of the year. MTG, very important satellite, uh, will be launched towards the end of next year. Uh, Euclid, Juice, uh, Hera, and several more. This uh, graph does not show all the satellite launches. There are many more also uh, in Earth observation in uh, Galileo. Uh, there will be several launches, which are, of course, not on this uh, slide here, but uh, just to show some of the highlights. But just to say that uh, many of them have international partnerships, uh, and many of them are extremely important for uh, developing uh, space in Europe. But let me now come to some of the core messages which I've been uh, mentioning and proposing through Agenda 2025. What you see on the left side here is the uh, share of, uh, of space spending as a share of GDP in the figures of 2019. Uh, you see, not to a surprise, uh, the US has uh, the highest uh, share per GDP, uh, then followed by Russia, Saudi Arabia, France, Japan, and the yellow bar is EU plus ESA member states. Uh, it's about a quarter of uh, what the share is uh, in the US. Uh, but in other words, that the spending uh, in Europe in space is uh, relatively small compared to other major uh, economies. If you would uh, take another graph, which is not shown here, is the GDP of uh, China, the US, and Europe, uh, and uh, sum up European EU plus ESA member states, you would have a similar GDP as the US and China, slightly below, but not much, but in the same order of magnitude. But in space, as you see, the spending is much less. But the situation is also, of course, uh, clearly expressed in the number of uh, spacecraft, or he expressed in tons, uh, which are being launched. Of course, ton is a very crude measure. Spacecraft are highly sophisticated with lots of electronics, very sophisticated instruments, but it's a measure to express how much is launched into space. You see the big bars of China, Russia, and the US, and you see here in circled or in the square, Europe much smaller. And this is, uh, of course, something that worries me as Director General of ESA, because my job as, uh, as uh, Director General of ESA is really to make sure that the European space capabilities are strong and are, as I mentioned before, that we are a strong partner also to international uh, partnerships uh, of which we have uh, quite a few. And this is something which is at the core of uh, what uh, uh, was published earlier this year, Agenda 2025. This is an agenda not only of ESA, not certainly not of me, it's an agenda for space in Europe, because what certainly is very clear is uh, Europe needs to catch up, Europe needs to accelerate in order to uh, not lose out and not be left behind. And that's why in this document you see a number of priorities that are addressing these issues, uh, what needs to be done in order to raise the profile, but also the funding level of space in Europe. First and foremost, of course, reinforcing the relationship with the Commission. Uh, and this is something that I put a huge emphasis on it. I've uh, worked in the Commission myself for a couple of years. I've been worked with the Commission for decades uh, through Copernicus, mostly my previous uh, uh, career. But certainly the EU is relationship is an extremely important one. And this is something where we need to make sure that uh, we align ourselves and uh, we are making sure that the funds are properly allocated because the complementarity is there the Commission having a very strong political power and force, uh, ESA being the technical agency, and I think this is uh, something that should uh, uh, make it quite easy uh, to work together. It has not always been the case, but certainly I'm committed to make it uh, easy and uh, quite straightforward. You see here commercialization, of course. Uh, one would say but without that you cannot uh, do space these days, perfectly correct. But in Europe, we are still lagging behind a lot. If you take the investments of uh, private uh, uh, companies in space uh, in Europe compared to the US, there's a factor of 15 in between uh, in last year's figures, which uh, uh, is very significant. And certainly Europe, as I said before, with a similar economy uh, needs to really speed up. You also see safety security, you see ESA transformation program challenges, all this has to go hand in hand. So what I did uh, in the last couple of months after the Agenda 25 was published, I was inviting so-called wise people, nine wise people, most of them previous ministers uh, in charge of space, but not active today as space ministers, so they have uh, more freedom to, to speak. Uh, also previous uh, DG of ESA, previous DG of the European Commission, a CEO of a private company, 
and a, a, a head of a, a previous head of a space agency. And I've really reflected with them very deeply what Europe needs to be and how Europe needs to address these challenges in order to really lift space up uh, in Europe. And uh, these four months of quite intense deliberations resulted in a report. It's a recommendation of this group to me. Uh, and uh, I have put forward or translated these recommendations into a, into a policy paper, actually a resolution in the ESA language, uh, and presented it to ministers uh, about a month ago in uh, Matosinos uh, in Portugal, where the ministers met and discussed uh, the recommendations I put forward to them for endorsement. And at the core of this are three accelerators and two inspirators, which they have endorsed and where they have given me a very strong mandate to develop them and to build or use these vehicles to build up and intensify space in Europe. But before I go to accelerators, a word on commercialization. And this is part of the Agenda 2025 where you see a number of actions listed here. I think you have all, you will all be very familiar of what this means, but certainly ESA needs to change gear. Uh, we should much more become a first buyer or anchor customer uh, in many commercial segments, not necessarily developing all the details of a spacecraft, but buying a service, buying data, for example. Still, uh, I want to make it clear, we are not uh, abandoning, abandoning completely the the development of uh, technology and spacecraft, this, this will always be ESA's core business to develop very complex uh, technology, very complex spacecraft uh, for space science or many others, but much more we have to uh, become a customer of uh, other services. And this is really the area where the commercial sector should develop, that we would like to encourage them with their dynamism and fast speed, that they can be much more responsive, much faster in offering solutions to us if we are a long-term reliable partner in many of these aspects. There are also many other actions you see here. Actually, I've created a new directorate uh, within ESA uh, just a few months ago uh, with a new department on commercialization, which really should uh, focus on many aspects on commercialization. We really mean it very seriously because this is something where Europe needs really, really to catch up. So back to the accelerators inspirators. This is the list uh, which uh, has been proposed, Space for a Green Future rapid and resilient crisis response and protection of uh, European space assets as three accelerators and two inspirators, as the name indicates, they should really inspire the generation Europeans, politicians, uh, the general public uh, to invest in uh, several space activities, to, uh, one of them being human space exploration, the other one, icy moon sampler return missions. And they are, of course, quite different in nature as compared to the accelerators, which are addressing very urgent needs. And this really is the concept of Action for Europe, focusing on urgent societal needs, as you have seen in the three titles of the accelerators, they focus on climate change, on the need to help people in case of crisis, uh, and really making sure that our satellite infrastructure network is at, at the full disposal of society. But of course, we also make use of what was done in the past, the investments that have been made, uh, Copernicus uh, satellite communication, to mention a few of them, but um, many more, uh, and really make sure that uh, we're not starting from a blank sheet of paper, but really building on the investments that have been made over the past. The users at the center, you may say that's obvious. Yes, it is. But uh, it's also obvious that uh, uh, we need to make sure that whatever we develop, and these are uh, the, the beginnings of, uh, I, I would hope, larger major programs, uh, which uh, should span over decades and certainly having similar sizes or should develop into sizes similar to Copernicus and Galileo today, of course, as we all know, it took 20 years, or so we started them 20, more than 20 years ago, but certainly something where we'd like to focus. But also, and the second last bullet is quite important, we would like to attract new funding sources, new funding sources outside the classical space funding sources. And this is fundamental, because if I only uh, look at the funding sources earmarked for space, then we are not gaining anything. You're just putting money from the left pocket to the right pocket, and that's not what we want. We really want to make sure that by putting the user at the center, we are addressing uh, also the, really the needs of society and people, and therefore uh, being also able to tap into other funding sources. Climate funding, as you all know, this is a huge topic uh, in Europe worldwide, but in Europe in particular, with the Green Deal, with national climate policies, becoming cl climate neutral by midst of the decade. And there are huge uh, funding uh, sources available, not uh, at all linked to space today, but certainly something I, I want to explore and see what uh, can be done. Similar for crisis management, but also protecting our space assets uh, in space uh, through 
uh, various uh, means uh, that are required. And obviously combining the strengths uh, of ESA, the EU member states, the Commission and the commercial sector. This will also be a new way of how we build up these accelerators, giving the commercial sector a much stronger role, much more autonomy, where we would like to build up these things together. Just to make it clear, these accelerators will not be built like a classical ESA program. Classically, we develop a program proposal, we put it on the table, uh, we negotiate with member states uh, and we get their subscriptions at uh, ministerial conferences and then of course we spend the money in industry in the member states uh, in order to develop the infrastructure. In this case, the ESA funded part will be a very small one, probably by far the smallest one, and I really would like to make these accelerators being built up as building blocks coming from contributions uh, from member states, uh, from the commercial sector, also outside the space domain, European Commission, and really negotiate one by one of what these building blocks can be. Let me go into these accelerators uh, one, one by one and just a few words on what they do and what they mean. As I said before, the one on green future is obviously uh, addressing a huge need of society to combat climate change. Uh, don't need to explain all the actions that are being taken at global level and at European level. You're all very familiar. But space can play a huge role. It's not only Earth observation. It's really the combination of uh, data from Earth observation satellites for sure, but also in situ measurements, hubs, uh, other information linking uh, those data with Earth system models, uh, making sure you better understand the system and making sure that uh, with the combination of uh, modern IT tools, artificial intelligence, machine learning, that you can make simulations of our planet and create uh, what we call information factories, green information factories. Digital Twin Earth is a simulation of our planet. Uh, it, it's uh, a huge effort, as you can imagine, to simulate our ecosystem, not only from an environmental and climate point of view, but also what's the impact on society, what's the impact on people. If you have global warming, if uh, the arid zones in Africa are drying and therefore people need to move away, migration certainly being an issue uh, which is uh, hotly debated and uh, is, uh, is necessary to be simulated as well. But we really would like to simulate what is the impact of our changes on our planet on people and what can be done to do that. And of course, this is simulating our uh, planet on a big computer. Uh, it's not a trivial exercise. We have started already, but certainly something we'd like to put a, a huge emphasis on it in order also to be linked with information factories uh, where products are being developed, many of them to support the decarbonization of the economy to reach uh, net zero emissions by 2050, as it is uh, the declared goal, certainly of uh, all the uh, countries uh, in Europe. You see on the bottom right, quantum gravimetry mission is one particular mission is not the only one, but certainly something that would be very interesting, a very interesting part to better uh, focus on this area. So what's the cost of not accelerating? Some people may say, look, if you build up a new accelerator, it costs a lot of money. Yes, uh, certainly funding is required, but not doing anything uh, to decarbonize uh, our economy is e even more expensive. These figures do not come from, from us. So they are uh, developed by economists. So you see here the the figures, hundreds of trillions of uh, dollars or euros, uh, which is the, the, the economic cost if we are not acting quick. Of course, space and satellites cannot uh, stop climate change, is obvious, but certainly make a very, very important contribution. Let me go to the next one, rapid and resilient crisis response. Similar uh, to the green future, some of it is caused by climate change or accelerated or intensified by climate change. Some of it, uh, other man-made disasters or like uh, 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 like accidents of chemical factories, but also earthquakes. Uh, any kind of crisis needs quick response on one side, data information, but also quickly and securely transmitted to people. And this has the beauty of uh, linking the accelerator with the secure connectivity network, uh, the EU flagship, which uh, Commissioner Breton is building up right now and will propose uh, to the member states, uh, especially early next year as a uh, uh, as, a, as a firm program of the European Union. And this really goes hand in hand. As I mentioned before, the EU and ESA need to work well together. On one side, content is provided through this accelerator. On the other side, secure connectivity and networks are developed uh, through the Commission context. And this is something I really would like to intensify and work very well together. Again, what is the cost of not uh, accelerating? What you see here on the left uh, hand side is a graph of the number of uh, disasters uh, in the last couple of uh, decades. Uh, I don't need to go into details, but uh, all, you all know that uh, floods, uh, fires, uh, storms have intensified uh, largely 
some of it uh, caused or certainly intensified by climate change. Uh, the damages uh, are equivalently increasing. You see here some figures on the right hand side of a single event uh, of the German floods or Central European floods, uh, tens of billions of uh, money needed for the recovery, similar for forest fires. These are huge uh, uh, damages. Of course, again, uh, our satellites are not stopping these disasters, but certainly they can help very much in uh, alleviating the economic impact uh, and the human impact on some of, some of these uh, uh, events. Number three, Accelerator uh, 3, protection of European space assets. Um, needless to say, and we have heard it also before, that m many more satellites are coming up to space. Uh, we have uh, just heard uh, uh, before that uh, Starlink is, uh, having a, is uh, about half of the active satellites uh, in orbit today. Uh, and we need to protect our own assets. Uh, ESA has a number of satellites uh, uh, which uh, uh, need to fly more and more uh, collision avoidance maneuvers. Uh, we have, uh, of course, all heard about the impact of the ASAT test uh, a couple of weeks ago. All this uh, creates more debris, uh, and uh, debris means uh, danger for our satellites, which are an essential integrated part of daily life, and therefore absolutely needed for our uh, society to function, as you perfectly know. On the right-hand side, space weather, very similar. Uh, sun flares are causing damages to satellites, uh, to ground infrastructure. Again, good and close information is needed in order to uh, protect our assets. Our assets meaning satellites, but also uh, astronauts in orbit. Just uh, last uh, couple of days, yesterday, in fact, I've uh, spoken to uh, Matthias Maurer, our astronaut. Um, uh, they're all fine and safe up there, but certainly the recent ESA test is something that is a worry and needs uh, replanning of some of the spacewalks, uh, which uh, has already happened. So this is um, what's the cost again of not acting of not accelerating active satellites in orbit. You all know these figures. Actually, it only ends here in 2020. If you add 2021, it goes even higher. Uh, and this is a reality. Uh, and this is something that we really need to address. I've also recently uh, had some interactions with the press uh, to highlight this topic. And this is uh, is a huge issue for everyone, uh, for all of us working in space, because uh, uh, we all need a safe, uh, uh, safe uh, management of our orbits in order to really make sure that our satellites can be benefiting our people. And this is not ag against any one person or one company who is launching many satellites, because some, in some occasions uh, my statement was uh, interpreted as being against Elon Musk. Not at all. Elon Musk is doing great things. But I think what we need to ensure is that uh, the issue as, as such is really um, at, uh, is put on the table. Uh, discussion takes place how to do it for the very own benefit of those putting uh, many satellites into orbit because we all depend on a good uh, management of uh, this outer space. But certainly this issue will become much more important in, in, the, in, the years to, in the months and years to come. One quick word on, uh, on the uh, inspirators. Uh, you see two of them, uh, human space exploration. Um, this is a very different nature than the previous ones. The accelerators are focusing on societal needs. The inspirators, as you see, really on inspiring people, but also making sure that the young generation is being attracted to space, is studying STEM, uh, but also that Europe uh, all together gets its uh, vision together and some uh, yeah, also energy, especially after the crisis, in order to have common dreams and common goals. And one of them is human space exploration, as you all perfectly know, today Europe does not have its own human space exploration capability. We are very happy to fly with uh, NASA and we uh, had very strong cooperations with Russia in the past. Uh, but in the future, and here I'm really thinking of 10 years ahead or 15 years ahead, I think the question needs to be raised with uh, heads of state and heads of governments. Does Europe want to have its independence? And if yes, uh, the time is now to really uh, discuss how to do it and what to do. And this is certainly a debate I uh, have been launching since a couple of months now, but I also see that it takes uh, it uh, gets a bit of speed because this is really a very fundamental question. This is a political decision that has to be made. It's not for me as ESA to express that because this really needs the collective effort of the governments uh, of Europe. And similarly, another inspirator, but this is uh, of a quite different nature, is an icy moon sample return, uh, which is quite uh, amazing if you think of it. Uh, astrobiologists say if you really want to discover life outside our planet, uh, then uh, a good place, even if the life is very primitive and very simple, a good place to look for would be the icy moons of uh, Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, and this is exactly what this uh, mission is proposing. 
to have a, a, a probe to be taken uh, to fly to one of these icy moons, land on it, drill into the ice cover because underneath there is uh, uh, water and this, there is an ice cover above, take a sample and bring it back to Earth and analyze what's there. Of course, this is a huge uh, undertaking uh, with today's technology just flying there takes roughly 10 years and of course on the way back as well unless we really change uh, propulsion uh, but it is something that takes a long time but just imagine that uh, this probe is being analyzed and you find maybe no life okay that's an, one answer but if you find some kind of very simple primitive life the question of course is does it have a DNA and is the DNA similar to us uh, or not uh, again this will uh, answer huge uh, uh, questions uh, and uh, quite fascinating as an idea of course a multi-decade undertaking but that's something I would like to put on the table in the space science context. Let me come to conclusion. So this all is on the on the table right now. I think we have made quite a bit of progress in Europe over the last couple of months uh, uh, starting with Agenda 2025, the accelerators, inspirators to raise the profile of uh, space in Europe. Uh, we are having a space summit ahead of us 16th of February uh, in Toulouse, um, uh, Mr. Macron will, uh, is expected to wrap up uh, the Space Summit, is inviting uh, the ministers of ESA and EU member states to really um, discuss and elaborate where, where should we go uh, as a uh, continent, as, as Europe. And then, of course, our next big milestone is, is the ESA ministerial conference in 2022, November, uh, which uh, should really be also uh, give us initial starting elements for the accelerators and inspirators, and obviously with other ministerial conferences, possibly another space summit to come after the end of next year. So with this, thank you very much.